Our first talk and speaker is uh, Gabriela Gonzalez. Uh, Gabriela is an engineering manager at Arista Networks who will talk your ear off about functional programming if you give her the chance. She is best known for her blog, HaskellForAll.com and for being the author of the DAL configuration language. Um, uh, she, she's gonna be talking to you today about, uh, uh, about namespaced Debrian indices. I don't know if I pronounced that right, hope I did. Um, over to you, Gabriela. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm gonna be giving a talk today on namespaced Debrian indices. And also very quickly before I begin, uh, I would like to thank the Meetup organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And uh, feel free to ask questions throughout the talk. I have explicit points within the talk where I will pause to uh, answer any questions that may have queued up. And if too many questions queue up, then um, maybe they'll let me know. All right, so uh, this talk is a longer presentation based on a blog post, which I published by the same name, Namespace De Bruyne Indices. And this talk differs from the blog post in two ways. The first way is that I'll spend more time on the motivation and the history and the logical progression leading up to this idea. And the second difference is that I'm gonna focus more on the user experience behind this idea and less on the actual implementation. If, you're, if you are more interested in the implementation, then I encourage you to read the blog post. And the idea I'm gonna present here is, is not a new one. So for example, there's something called Cine, which predates this work and presents basically the exact same idea. I just happened to discover it independently in the course of working on interpreted languages. And so the way I'm going to structure this talk is in four sections. In the first section, I'm going to talk about a beta reduction and introduce that because that's a very strong motivation for this feature. And in the second part of this talk, I'm gonna talk about uh, name preservation and why we want to be able to preserve names in the course of beta reduction. And then I'll follow up by explaining the actual trick, namespace to point indices. And then finally, I'll compare that briefly to existing approaches. So I first stumbled upon this idea while working on Morte, which you can think of as a very simple Lambda calculus. Uh, it's essentially the calculus of constructions plus in the import system. And part of the reason I worked on Morte was it was to introduce my internet of code idea, which I won't go into here. And also Morte is the predecessor of another language, which I created called Dahl. And all of my languages are named after characters from the game of Planescape Torment. And uh, Morte and Dahl are both total functional programming languages. And that means that all expressions in these languages can be beta reduced to a normal form. Uh, so I'll give an example using the Dahl REPL. So in, this is a sample rep session from the REPL. And what I'm gonna do in this session is I'm gonna import a function from the Dahl prelude called list slash generate. And so I can provide a URL and bind it to uh, this function right here. And whenever I import this value, it's going to print out the type as a handy indicator. And I don't expect that you can um, read doll types. So I will, I will walk you through this type. So you, this says essentially that generate is a function of three arguments. The first function argument named n is a natural number. And this represents how many elements of the list to generate. The second function argument named a is a type. And that is the type of the list elements that we wish to generate. The third function argument is named f, and that is a function from a natural number to this type a, which we bound here. And you can think of this, you can think of this as a generation function. Its input is gonna be the index in the list, and its output will be that list element. So conceptually, this generates a list of elements using a generation function. And here's a sample use of that function. So I can say, I want you to generate 10 Boolean values using the natural even function. And so the first value will be true because zero is even. The second value will be false because one is not even and so forth. It'll keep alternating as we generate the list. But what's cool about doll is that, uh, let's say you were not convinced by my explanation of the type. And let's say you were also not convinced by the sample uh, use of this function that I gave. I could really convince you by calling a generate function on just one argument instead of three arguments. So you can think of this sort of like as an unsaturated function call, kind of. And we can ask the doll interpreter to evaluate that. And it can actually evaluate and print the result just fine. Uh, 
And what you'll get is a function like this. So I'll say now this is, we, since we supplied one function argument, this is now a function of two arguments and still A and still F are generation function. But now because we supply, now because it knows how many elements of the list it can generate, it can already start to partially evaluate the result. And it knows, well, I'm gonna generate a list of 10 values. And the first value will be the function F applied to zero because that's the first index and then F1 and F2 and so on. So this gives us a very intuitive feel for what the function does. And so what we're looking at there, that's basically is beta reduction. So to a first approximation, you can kind of think of beta reduction as being kind of the same thing as function evaluation. Uh, and so like anytime you have a function call, evaluating that is, is essentially beta reduction. So for example, if we take the natural even function and we apply it to the argument two, we would call that a, a beta reducible expression, also known as a beta redex for short. And so that would be true in this case if we were to beta reduce that expression, which is the same thing as, in, in this case, that's the exact same thing as function evaluation. But uh, in traditional languages where, they, where evaluation differs from beta reduction is that beta reduction is also capable of evaluating under a lambda. So here's a more interesting example. So we have an out, so lambdas, for people who are not familiar with lambdas, they're kind of like anonymous functions. So here is a function whose outer argument is some value a named bool. And then inside the body of this anonymous function, we're going to invoke another function on a value. So we're going to say, we're going to, in, we're going to define in line a function that takes a Boolean value and then creates a, a list with two copies of that value and then call it on our input value a. And even though we don't know what a is, we can still evaluate that inner function, right? We can just take all occurrences of b right here and we can substitute them with a. And then so we can beta reduce this to get this result right here. And so this is how beta reduction differs from evaluation in many programming languages. Because like in Haskell, I cannot take this function and just like evaluate in the REPL and get an answer like this, right? GHC does not support that. And so beta reduction is a very powerful tool for interpreting incomplete code, such as the generate 10 example on the previous slide. And so beta reduction, one, one useful thing about beta reduction is that it can improve code comprehension. So here's an example, another example from the doll prelude, prelude. So there is a function, there is a, so the doll does not have a greater than operator. Either it's actually a function which is defined in the prelude. It's a named function called greater than. And if I were to go to that function, I would see, I'm not gonna walk through the implementation in a lot of detail. I will just note that the greater than function is defined in terms of less than. And if we were to click through, we would see that the less than function is defined in terms of the not function and the greater than equal function. And then if we were to actually display the tree of dependencies, we would get something like uh, this right here. So it says greater than depends on less than, less than depends on not and greater than equal and greater than equal depends on less than equal. And so suppose I wanted to understand what this function does without having to like, you know, jump to definition and, and kind of piece things together in my head. What I can do is I can just beta reduce the greater than function and then have the interpreter just tell me just get rid of all the indirection and tell me what is this function actually doing here. And so if I input the original URL into the interpreter, it'll resolve all the imports, it'll beta reduce the expression until there's nothing left that can be beta reduced. So this is all primitive built-ins in the language. And I get something that looks like this. And I'm not gonna walk through exactly what that does. The key thing to take away here is that we're just eliminating indirection as a means of code comprehension. So both Morte and Dahl have this nifty feature where you can evaluate an expression by first beta reducing the expression, and then you can pretty print the beta reduced expression. And this generalized notion of evaluation works for arbitrary expressions like functions as we absolutely illustrated here. You're not limited to evaluating expressions that return plain or inert data. So like in comparison, like in Haskell, you can in the REPL, you can only display things that have a show instance, right? And in Dahl or Morte, it's kind of like everything has a show instance without exception. So here are some exa more examples of what you can do with beta reduction. So let's say I, I import the sum function from the doll prelude, which is just like Haskell sum function. It adds up a list of numbers and I'll define an anonymous function, which takes X and Y as function arguments. And then we'll add a list containing X and Y. And if I were to beta reduce that expression, then the interpreter is like, oh, we can just cut out the middleman here. This is basically the exact same thing as X plus Y. You don't need to use this very indirect way of adding them using the sum function. So, you, so beta reduction is a way of inlining code. 
like imagine, sorry, sorry, just imagine like if you in your IDE, you could just click on expression, and just tell the IDE, I just want you to keep beta reducing this expression where I tell it to you. Like this is how you can, how you should start to think about using this. Beta reduction can also do symbolic simplification. So for example, this is a function that it'll take an input name X of type bool, and then it'll say, okay, if X is true, then return true. Otherwise return false. And the interpreter is smart enough to realize, you know, I don't need to know what X is. I know that it's always gonna, it's always gonna, this is basically the same thing as just returning X, right? It's the identity function on bools. So beta reduction can, is a powerful tool for symbolic simplification of code. And another thing you can do is, um, and this is specific to languages that support types as first class values, such as dollar morte, or, or also many dependently typed languages. Uh, because you can evaluate type level functions, then you can beta reduce types as well to better understand, to get rid of indirection in type level signatures. You'd be kind of like, you know, in a Haskell package, sometimes you'll see some like type synonym. And you'll be like, I, don't, I just get rid of the type synonym. I just want to see like, what is the underlying fully expanded type? And this is exactly what that would be useful for. Okay, so uh, I'll pause right here. Before I go on to name preservation, I just want to ask people if they have any questions for me. I don't see any questions on this Twitch chat right now. Yeah. Anyway, so feel free to queue up questions. Otherwise, I'll move on. Okay, so uh, so as I mentioned, like Dahl and Morty support this generalized notion of uh, evaluation where we can not only beta reduce arbitrary expressions, but we can also pretty print arbitrary expressions. So it's very important that when we pretty print these arbitrary expressions that we preserve the names, the variable names as much as possible so, they, so that they are very appealing to the user. And that's what this section will focus on right here, name preservation. So here are some examples of how beta reduction can preserve names. So in the simple case, it's just the original function, right? So here I have the identity function on Boolean values. And if I pretty print, if I beta reduce and pretty print that, I want to make sure that the resulting function uses the same name the user used. So for example, if the user picked the name uh, X as the variable name, we want to use that in the result too. We don't want to choose some like random name. Here's a slightly more interesting example. So we have a function where inside the body of the function, we have a function application and the interpreter is smart to realize that the second function argument, this one right here, should have the same name as this one right here. And similarly, even though we have Y here, the interpreter knows to substitute this Y with X. So then the final result will have X here. So the name X came from this variable right here. Oops, sorry. And then here is a more sophisticated example. So here I've defined the composition function on Boolean valued functions, kind of like a monomorphic version of Haskell's dot. And then I will use that to compose uh, two identity functions on Boolean values. And what I should get back is an identity function on Boolean values. But the question is, you know, which variable name do we use for the identity function on the Boolean values? Do we use Y? Do we use Z? And the answer is we use X. So the interpreter knows that this X should actually come from this one right up here. And similarly, this X name right here came from this one right here. So there are certain rules we would like to implement for like how input names correspond to output names. All right, so here comes the challenge example that many implementations will fail pretty hard on. This is, my, this is my pathological test case that I actually put a lot of languages through. So suppose we have a function like this. So it's, there's an outer function which takes an argument named x of type bool. And then inside the body of the function, we have a nested anonymous function which takes two arguments. The first one named y will have type bool. And the second argument of type x will Oh, sorry, the second argument name X will have type text and then we'll return Y. And then we immediately apply that to the outer value named X. All right, and so the question is, what is the normal form for this expression? So we know it's gonna be a function of two arguments. So I'll give a little bit of a hint here. All right, and so the question would be, what names do we use for all three positions here? So I think it's like pretty clear that we can be pretty confident that this name right here should be X, it should match this name right here. And then similarly, the only function argument named, named, sorry, the only function argument of type text is named X. So we should expect to use X here too. So X here, X here, but what should go here? Because what we want is we know that this function should return whatever the, so whatever, so basically this function is essentially always returning its func first function argument. So 
the final result should be this x right here. Uh, but there's a problem. So suppose we try to return that outer x, we would get we would get the wrong result, which would be this one right here. This function not only has the wrong value, it has the wrong type. So the, the correct result should return a Boolean value, whereas this function is returning a text value. And, uh, and the reason we're having difficulties here is because this inner x function argument is shadowing this outer x function argument right here. So we don't have a good way for this function result to say, I want to return this x here instead of this x right here. And this example is was an implementation error I had in my very first draft of Morte. I made the exact same mistake. This is literally issue number one from the Morte repository. And in the discussion thread in, of that issue is where I came up with this trick, which is the, the basis of this talk. I'm not gonna go into the trick just yet. I'm gonna first talk about a little bit about prior art very quickly. So um, this is an issue that, fa that faces many interpreters. So even if the interpreter doesn't pre-print expressions, you still need a good way to avoid what's called name capture, where you accidentally put a variable in a place where it's shadowed by another function argument in the course of substituting in values. And so a well-behaved algorithm for substitution is called a capture avoiding substitution algorithm. And there are two main ways of doing this. So the first way is what's called a named representation. So where you preserve variable names, but anytime you detect a, a conflict between variable names in the course of substitution, you will add a unique suffix to one or the other variables to avoid uh, name capture. Another approach is to maintain a separate syntax tree for substitution, where instead of variable names, you use numeric indices. And there are, mul there are multiple ways of doing this, but probably the most commonly known one is De Bruyne indices. And if you do this, then you can actually solve, it has a very elegant way of solving the shadowing problem. So I'll actually first explain De Bruyne indices in more detail, and then I'll also talk about named representations. So if we were to convert our original expression to the equivalent representation using De Bruyne indices, well, first off, we throw away the types. For right now, we don't care about them. And then what we'll do is we will, we will, not, we will just not even include variable names in the lambdas. We just throw away the variable names. And instead, whenever we reference a variable, we will count outwards how many lambdas we want to refer to. So for example, if we had at zero here, it would refer to the closest enclosing lambda, this one right here. And then, it, and then if it was one, like here, then it says, okay, refer to the next enclosing lambda, which would be this one right here. So this is the function that takes two arguments and returns the first function argument. And what's nice about De Bruyne indices is that they handily solve the shadowing problem because it's as if every variable had the same name, right? And, and anytime you want to, and anytime that you'd like to refer to a shadow variable, you do so by using the, the numbers disambiguate things. So you can count outwards and uh, from lambdas, even though the lambdas all have nothing uh, differentiating them. So this is great. So the bug is gone for capture avoiding substitution, uh, but now we have the problem that the original names are gone too. And there's some ways of addressing that. And I'll present the way that I prefer later on in this talk. So another approach is to not use De Bruyne indices. And instead we can just, um, whenever we detect a collision, we add some unique suffix to either variable name to fix the collision. So for example, one thing we could do is we can actually, if when we detect the collision, we could rename this variable name to X right here. So we, we, sorry, we can rename it to X1. And now there's no ambiguity. We can now safely refer to the outer variable without accidentally referring to this variable right here. And I will call this approach uh, name mingling. So for example, this is actually what GHC does. And we can see this. So even though GHC does not support generalized evaluation, uh, you can still get something which is kind of similar by looking at GHC's core intermediate representation. So I can put our pathological function into a Haskell module. And then I can ask GHC, uh, just try to evaluate this function and, uh, sorry, just try to optimize this function and pretty print and, and display the intermediate core representation. And I'll get something that looks like this. So GHC optimizes it away and realizes this is in fact a function which returns its, func its first function argument. And, um, but you'll notice that GHC uh, did two things to avoid the name collision. So first off, it renamed this variable to underscore because that variable was unused. That, that's less important. The more important thing that GHC did is that GHC added a unique suffix to this X right here to avoid the collision. So even if GHC could pretty print arbitrary expressions, the names would be kind of mangled and not as pleasing as say in doll, for example. 
Okay, so JC doesn't support uh, generalized evaluation. So name mingling is not as visible. So, uh, but name mingling still actually is exposed to the user experience in the types though. So let's, for example, let's say I have a type error where I try to compose a list with anything. Uh, I would get a type error that looks something like this. So it'll say cannot match expected type, a function from B to C with a list of A zero. So here the zero is the mangled name because there was a collision between type variables. And even when you don't have type errors, you can still get mangled names too. So for example, this is a well-typed function. Uh, but if I, try to inter if I try to infer the type of this function, I will get a type like this, where they, we have these A1, A2 suffixes like these. And as Haskell developers, we get used to this very quickly. But if you think about it, you know, polluting types with relevant numbers is kind of jarring, you know? All right, so <clears throat> what does doll actually do on that pathological example? And if we evaluate this within the REPL, we'll get something that looks like this. So doll will actually add a unique suffix, uh, sorry, an integer suffix to this X right here, indicating that doll actually wants to refer to this outer X right here. And this suffix acts a lot like a De Bruyne index. So we're counting outwards to, the, to refer to distinguish which X we wish to refer to. And in the upcoming sections, I'll explain this trick in a bit more detail. Uh, before I continue, I just want to check do, I want to pause and ask, do people have any questions they'd like to ask? It seems to be like a nine second delay before things appear on Twitch. Yeah, I'm so. familiar with Twitch delays. Yeah. <laughs> so let's just wait one few extra seconds. <laughs> Ah, so one of the people asked, is functional programming the future? And I would say, yes, definitely. <laughs> I'm very convinced it is. <laughs> All right, so if we don't have any other questions, I'll just go ahead and uh, continue from here. Okay, so let's, just, let's talk more about what a name representation actually looks like under the hood. So typically you get uh, something that looks like this. So we would say there would be some syntax tree, which will represent in Haskell, like this data type right here. And this syntax tree will have uh, three constructors. The first constructor will be the variable name, so which will model as a string. And there'll be a Lambda constructor, which will contain the variable uh, bound by the Lambda, and also the body of the Lambda, which is itself a syntax tree. And then finally, we'll support a function application. So we can apply a function to an argument. And in this representation, I'm not gonna include types just to simplify things a bit. And the above syntax tree is, so for example, suppose we wanted to convert an, a Lambda expression like this one right here to uh, the corresponding syntax tree. Uh, it would look something like this right here. So we would say, okay, uh, Lambda. So we, we have Lambda, which binds F and that's wrapping another Lambda, which binds X. Then we have a function application of the variable named F to the variable named X. And I won't present the substitution algorithm for this. It's not relevant to the talk, but this gives you an idea of like what the tree looks like. And now let's contrast that with the tree we would use uh, if we were doing De Bruyne indices. So here, the first thing that differs is that the variable name is now an integer instead of uh, a string, because there are no names anymore. The second difference is that our Lambda no longer binds a name. It's kind of like an anonymous, well, it's basically like an anonymous variable name, kind of. And then we still, function application still looks exactly the same thing as before. So for example, uh, we, we represent this Lambda expression. Uh, so sorry, uh, this expression like here would be, would be translated to this De Bruyne indices version right here, which would be represented as this expression right here. So we say Lambda, wrapping a Lambda, wrapping a function application of, a, of the variable at index one to an argument of the variable index zero. And it knows that this index one is referring to the variable bound by this lambda right here. And the variable at index zero is referring to the variable bound by this lambda right here. And oh yeah, so that's basically restating what I just covered on the prior slide. And the nice thing about De Bruyne indices is that this there are several conventions for replacing variable names with numbers. 
Uh, but write indices has several nice properties. One of the first properties is that the index assignment is context-free. So meaning that even if we were to embed this expression within a larger uh, expression, these, these indices would still be the same. They'd be unaffected. Another nice property about De Bruyne indices is that they buy, is that indices tend to be low, especially zero is a very common index. And finally, the capture avoiding substitution algorithm for De Bruyne indices is very simple. In fact, it's so simple that it fits on a slide. So this is adapted from uh, Pierce's Types and Programming Languages book. I'm not gonna walk through how it's implemented. Again, this talk is really not gonna focus too much on uh, implementation details, but what I but I do want to just highlight two things right here. The first thing I'd like to highlight is that the algorithm is very concise, right? It's it's very simple, and it also doesn't require any sort of supply of fresh variable names. It doesn't require name mangling, and so it's a very elegant algorithm too. And I will take a quick detour to introduce a concept which is related to De Bruyne indices. So I want to introduce the notion of alpha alpha reduction. So I will define alpha reduction to mean uh, co the converting an expression to the equivalent representation using De Bruyne indices. Uh, I have it, so like, I'm not sure if this has actually already been defined before. I actually tried to find an existing prior definition of this. Uh, I couldn't find one, but like, I'm pretty sure like if I just went to any programming languages person and I, and I, and I use the term alpha reduction, they would know exactly what I was talking about, which is basically is, is this thing right here. And uh, the reason I call this alpha reduction is because you can define alpha equivalence as follows. Two terms are alpha equivalent if their alpha reduced forms are identical. And alpha equivalence basically means that two expressions are the same up to renaming of variable names. Here's an example. So if I have this expression right here, which is the identity function, and here's another expression, which is the identity function, and I, I, basically, these are morally the same function. We've just renamed the variables. And we, we would commonly say that these two functions are alpha equivalent. And the reason they are both alpha equivalent is because if we alpha reduce both of these functions, then what we get is this expression right here, which is the same. So we know that these two functions are essentially the same function, at least, as, at least from the perspective of variable names. And the reason I like to define things this way is it also parallels the way that beta equivalence is defined. So we can say that two expressions are beta equivalent if their beta reduced forms are identical. And then you can also define things like alpha beta equivalent, which means that their alpha beta reduced forms are identical. All right, anyway, sorry for that detour. Okay, so now let's compare the named and nameless representations. So each representation has its strengths, but also its weaknesses. So in the nameless representation, we have the fact that it, its substitution works very well. It's easy to reference shadowed variables, uh, but we know, but we lost the variable names unless, unless we maintain some mapping back to the original variable names. And the name representation preserves variable names, but it has a more complicated and messy substitution algorithm. So what we really want is some algorithm that combines the best of both worlds. And you kind of think of this talk as just kind of saying like, why not both, right? Can we get a representation that combines the named and the nameless representation as elegantly as possible. And there are several ways to do this, but I have a very specific way in mind, which I can summarize with this syntax tree right here. So this syntax tree is essentially the same thing as the named representation, except that now we add a De Bruyne index to every variable name. So this additional int field for variables, we don't make any changes to lambdas though. When you bind a variable name, you only specify the name and you do not, you do not specify the index. And I call this representation namespace De Bruyne indices. And to give you an intuition for how this representation works, I'll walk through a few simple examples. So I'm gonna define a function of three function arguments named X, Y, and Z in that order. And I wanna create a function and, the, and I want the, function, the body of the function to return the third function argument, so the inner X. And so the way I would do that is I would write X at zero. It's saying return the X that is closest to me, the one at De Bruyne index zero. And that would correspond to this syntax tree right here. And so the main difference is you can see this variable constructor stores not only the variable name, but also the index two, zero in this case. So I think, that, I think that's pretty straightforward. Now let's make it a little bit more interesting. Now suppose I wanna return the second function argument. I would change the body of the function to be y at zero, 
And that would correspond to this syntax tree right here. So saying that I want to return the innermost y. So notice that the De Bruyne index here is still zero. It's not one because it's, not, it's no longer counting all lambdas. It's only counting lambdas that bind a variable named y. In other words, the De Bruyne index here is namespaced to the variable y. So that's why it's called namespace De Bruyne indices. So here we return the innermost y, which happens to be this one right here. And then finally, if I want to return the outermost x, then I would return x at 1. It says, OK, don't return the closest x to me. Return the next closest bound variable named x. And so that will return this one right here. And so what's neat about this is because we mix variable names with De Bruyne indices, now we've gained the ability to reference shadowed variables. OK, so which is actually very cool. And that's essentially what, the, uh, so another way you can think about namespace De Bruyne indices is just adding language support for referencing shadow variables. Sorry, give me a second. Uh, sorry about the interruption. So, uh, okay, continuing. So there's two parts of this trick. So if we just did the first part of the trick alone, uh, what we would find is that um, it would tend to produce code which is very non-ergonomic because every time you reference the variable, you would have to have this at index associated with that variable. So the second thing we're going to do here is we're going to elide indices that are zero. In other words, in, so this code right here becomes so this code here at the top becomes syntactic sugar for writing code like this. And so whenever the parser is parsing this code and it sees the index is missing, it will implicitly insert the index zero so the user does not have to explicitly write that out. So both of these, both the syntactic sugar version and the version without syntactic sugar would generate the exact same syntax tree, which is this one right here. But also the syntactic sugar works for pretty printing too. So anytime we pretty print an expression, and we run across a variable with an index of zero, we will elide the index when pretty printing that. So if we were to then pretty print this same syntax tree, the result would not have any zero indices in the result. Uh, so now let's go through the previous examples and show how they would work with these indices. So our very first example, because it does not reference any shadow variables, the indices are all zero, and so we can elide them. Uh, same thing for the second example. So uh, we could simplify this example right here be, to remove the index, because again, we're not referencing any shadow variables. But in this final example, we necessarily reference a shadow variable. So the index is mandatory. We cannot elide it here. And so the neat thing about the neat thing about this trick is that because the syntactic sugar makes indices, un, this trick makes the, the indices fairly unintrusive because they will only occur whenever you need variable shadowing. And the vast majority of code doesn't need variable shadowing. Case in point doll. So like almost the entire doll prelude has none of these indices in it. And so typically, these indices will only arise in two cases. So the first case is the user wishes to explicitly reference a shadow variable, which is kind of rare. It does happen, but now they have language support for it. So now they don't have to you know, add a little prime or a number to the end of the variable. They can just use the index to, to disambiguate things. The second case is that uh, sometimes the indices will appear in a beta reduced result. Uh, the great, the, and the, the running example I've been using is a great example of that. So here we have a function where the input code has no indices. There, are, there is no variable shadowing in the input code. But in the, output, in the output code, if we wish to preserve the original names, then we have to reference shadow variables. And so that still requires a visible index. And one of the nice things about this trick is that the substitution algorithm is very simple. It's almost as simple as the original De Bruyne indices algorithm. Again, I'm not going to walk through the implementation, but it's basically just as concise. And I want to stress that the implementation is not the key part here. There are more efficient ways to implement this algorithm. And uh, the key thing I want to take away here really is the desired user experience. Like I believe pretty strongly that languages should add support for referring to shadow variables using this mechanism. In particular, I believe we need to allow users to reference shadow variables both in input code, and we also need to permit output code to reference shadow variables too. And we'll get lots of nice emergent properties if we do that. 
So sometimes when I explain this trick to people, they say, okay, I, I'm kind of down, I'm kind of on board with the idea of adding indices to the output, because sometimes the output may introduce unexpected shadow variables, but I'm kind of reticent to allow users to have shadow in, shadow to reference shadow variables in input code. Some people view that as a misfeature. Uh, but personally, I think like it's actually a comp uh, it's fair, it's you should still do it. And here's here's why. So let's say I, again, let's go back to a function like this one. And this is kind of contrived, but we have a function where we have we bind two variables named x, and we want to refer to the outer variable named x, right? And in a language where we didn't support, and sorry, sorry. And so let's say we have language support for referencing shadow variables like here, right? And so uh, now suppose that we eta expand that expression. In other words, we bind a variable named a and then call it same function on a. So this is basically the same function, except now the outer variable has been renamed from x to a. And lo and behold, when we do that, the shot, the because the shadowing disappears, the indices disappear too. But now suppose that our language did not provide language support for shadowing variables, then the user would have had to mangle the variable name in order to disambiguate the two variables, maybe by adding a little prime to it or a one or something like that. And then even if we were to fix the shadowing by renaming the outer variable, the user introduced mangling doesn't disappear. The user has irreversibly scarred the variable name. So by, I think it's actually better to use language native support for referencing shadow variables because then the language can actually fix and remove the indices when it detects that the shadowing is gone. Okay, so uh, any other questions before we move on to the final section of the talk? No? Oh, oh yeah, so the question is, I'm very new to the Haskell programming language and applying functional programming. Anyway, what are the real world use cases of this pattern technique? Um, so I, I assume this is asking, what are the real world use cases of uh, this namespace to broing indices trick. That, that is how I'll interpret this question. Uh, the way I think about it is that um, this is very useful for code comprehension. So going back to the examples of beta reduction in the first example of this talk, being able to beta reduce and preprint arbitrary expressions can be a powerful tool for better understanding code and also inlining code. Uh, for example, like I've had to work on code bases that were very large and with a, with a decent IDE, and sometimes in order to understand what the code is doing, I have to do like extensive jump to definition. But even if I have ID support for jumping to definitions, it can still be kind of difficult to like understand what is going on to just put all the pieces together in like one cohesive whole. And so just being able to like inline everything to beta reduce everything, I think would have been made my life way easier than trying to stitch things together in my head. So that for me is like one of the key real world, real world use cases of this trick. All right, so if there aren't any other questions, then I'll go ahead and continue. So you might think when introduced with this trick, uh, isn't this essentially the same thing as name mangling? Like you're, that you can think of almost as the De Bruyne index as just another way of adding a unique suffix to the variable name. And there's one key difference between the namespace De Bruyne indices and name mangling, which is that, again, it, it's, it's the exact same thing as I pointed out on the previous example, which is that, uh, a De Bruyne index will only exist so long as shadowing exists. And so when the shadowing disappears in the course of beta reduction, then the, the De Bruyne index will also disappear. Whereas if the user or the interpreter mangles the variable name in order to avoid shadowing, then that name, bling, that name mangling is permanent. So it doesn't go away. And so that's why I, I slightly prefer name mangling. I'm oh, sorry, that's why I slightly prefer namespace De Bruyne indices. Also because uh, namespace deployment indices are just way easier to implement. It's so simple in comparison to the name mingling algorithm. It's almost like a free win. Uh, so the second uh, second reason, so the second way that name mingling benefits uh, compared to, sorry, the second reason why how namespace deployment indices uh, improves upon um, name mingling is that it also improves the type level experience too. So even if we put in pathological expressions such as this one, the inferred type has no mangle names in the type. Whereas like if you did something like this in a, in a language that does uses name mangling, then the type will have mangle names such as like, you know, X1, such as this example right here. Uh, 
you might also want to compare this to De Bruyne indices too. So a common uh, a common alternative approach that some languages will do is that they'll have separate trees, one with names and one without names, and and then they'll maintain a mapping between the two trees. And um, and I feel like that's much so I feel like that's much more complicated for a couple of reasons. One is that you have to maintain two separate types, one for the name representation and one for the nameless representation. The second thing is that because they're two separate syntax trees, uh, you maintain the mapping between them is also a little bit complicated too. And if you just combine them in the same tree using namespace to point indices, it's so much simpler in comparison. Another nice property of this is, is specific to alpha reduction, which I mentioned earlier on in the talk. So whenever you alpha reduce, uh, if you alpha reduce a named representation to a nameless representation, you get a different syntax tree. But if you use namespace De Bruyne indices, then whenever you alpha reduce an expression, you actually get back the original same uh, syntax tree because you can out in the namespace De Bruyne indices, it's as if you had renamed all variables to the same variable name. So for example, in DAL, you can actually, you can ask the interpreter to alpha reduce an expression. And what it will do is it'll just go through the tree. It'll rename all the variable names to underscore, and then we'll use De Bruyne indices to disambiguate them. So, so traditional De Bruyne indices are just the, uh, are, are a degenerate case of namespace De Bruyne indices where all the variables are named underscore. And what's nice about this is then that uh, the, uh, the result of alpha reduction is the same type as the input. So we don't need separate syntax trees for, for alpha reducing things. So namespace De Bruyne indices combine the best of both worlds. We preserve names like a traditional named representation and we get a mangling free substitution algorithm like drawing indices. And that means that we can pretty print arbitrary beta reduced expressions. And we also get as a bonus language support for referencing shadow variables in the source code. And I find that this trick is most appropriate for languages that's, that desire the ability to pretty print beta reduced expressions. But even if your language doesn't do that, I still think it's a useful thing to do if only because it'll simplify the, the implementation quite a bit compared to having to maintain like this very complicated syntax tree or complicated substitution algorithm. And this approach has been vetted very extensively in the wild via the doll language. And if you would like to adopt this in your project and get in and test drive a real and efficient implementation of this trick, uh, I have a project on GitHub called Fall From Grace, which implements exactly this trick. It will a, a, a very efficient version of this trick. And you can actually fork that project if you want to build your own um, interpreted programming language. Okay, so yeah, I think that concludes this talk and I'll just um, open the floor for any additional questions that may remain. Well, Gabrielle, if you don't mind, while we wait for the, uh, I guess, chat to catch up, I might ask one. Mm -hmm. Is there any interaction between this and like type checking of any sort or would you, are those that are totally orthogonal in your implementations of this idea? Uh, it, it's It's very, it, it, it plays very nicely with type checking. So actually I had an entire section of this talk, which I had to cut for time reasons, but um, basically the type checking algorithm ends up being, uh, so basically for the same reason that it leads to very nice results for beta reduced expressions, it also leads to very nice results for inferred types too. So for example, it handles collisions in type variables very well and uh, type errors look much better and inferred types look much better too. Interesting. So somehow it's it's a lot easier to propagate, I guess, like guesses on types, uh, whichever direction you're going. I, I'm just trying to imagine. I, I haven't actually tried this approach myself at all, but I can kind of uh, see that. Okay. Yeah. The reason it works well is because anytime you have a name collision, instead of having to mangle the type, you just have to add that index to it and everything just kind right. of works. Yeah. And you have your answer right away without actually <laughs> looking up a bunch of additional stuff, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Um, doesn't look like we have any. Yeah, I think we. Well. I think that's good. Great. Thank you so much, Gabriela, for this talk. It really was a uh, uh, really appreciate you taking the time to talk at our meetup. Um, really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um,